Hey everybody, it's Leroy from Leroy Gaming, and today I am here to bring to you my Vampire Ascendant build for Asterion. Now this is a monk rogue build that you can use for any character, but it gets taken to a whole new level if you pick Asterion. Now a couple quick disclaimers for this video. I am going to be showing a little combat example. I will be going over how to get all the elements of this build. It does not highly, uh, it doesn't require illithid powers, although I do use two of them. I will show that later on in the video. I will go over fully leveling the character. I'll go over the gear that I personally have for him and some of the recommendations. Now I do also want to point out that I used Asterion, even though he wasn't my main character, I mainly used them for moving around and for all my, pretty much all my checks, etc. Uh, because I'm not a big fan of swapping characters depending on what the situation is. Call me lazy. It's okay. Uh, so I wanted to build him so that he could, you know, identify traps, disarm traps, open locks, etc. And still he has been able to uh, pass all the skill checks, conversation checks, etc, etc. So he's meant to be highly functional, not just min-max for damage, even though his damage is insane. I will point out the last two bosses you fight in the final encounter. He soloed both of those in less than two rounds pretty much while other characters were fighting minor enemies. I did not want to spoil that so I'm just going to be doing a minor encounter to kind of show things that shouldn't be spoilery at all. Um, that should help out. Now with that being said I can't be completely spoiler free in this video. So the very first section I'm going to talk about after the intro here uh, has to do with the vampire, vampire Ascension and how that's gained. So if you do not want to be spoiled on that, do use the timestamps below and jump to the next section where I will talk about um, how to build out the character. The Vampire Ascension portion is not required, but obviously it helps out a ton to take this to a whole new level of dumb damage and functionality. So I hope you guys find this all helpful. Now without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the build. All right, so this first section I want to mention is a spoiler section. I want to get this out of the way. So we can skip to the next section, which should be the combat section, if you don't want to be spoiled about um, Asterion's story. Now, that warning being said, basically, you can become a Vampire Ascendant. And the way you do this is you simply follow Asterion's main story till the end. It will culminate in Act 3. You will face down uh, Asterion's Vampire Lord. And when you defeat them, you're gonna have defeat him. You're gonna have one or two options. You can either kill him, or you can basically do something kind of evil, and it's gonna make him take your place and a sacrifice. And then you sacrifice all seven thousand souls to become a vampire ascendant. And if you do, you get this crazy passive. Basically, behold the vampire ascendant. Thousands of souls have brought you powers, granting you a couple very important things. First, you get an updated bite. It's called the Senate Bite. You still keep your normal bite, but this is the new one. It's insane, as you can see. It does 66 necrotic damage and it heals you for 66. You also will become happy when you bite somebody with this, just like the normal buff, which is basically a plus one buff to, to hit uh, and a bunch of saves, etc. So very, very potent. You get the option to cast Misty Escape, which is basically the gaseous form. And then finally, and most importantly, you get a 1 to 10 damage, necrotic damage bonus to weapon and unarmed attack rolls. So as you can see here, probably getting a build that has a ton of attacks is a huge benefit. So very, very powerful buff, and we're going to be utilizing that. So that's what you get for finishing up the story. Uh, and you also get this kind of really cool red kind of glow. So uh, again, that's the end of the spoiler section. All right, now I'm going to show you kind of a uh, combat example here. Big thing I want to kind of show the Steel Watcher. These are level 11, pretty tough uh, NPCs that you're going to be fighting. Well, potentially fighting, not, uh, depending on what you do in the story. 
Uh, so kind of want to show things off. Uh, for the most part, I did want to also point out I like casting uh, Warding Bond from my Paladin on Asturian. And what this basically does, it gives you a plus one bonus to armor class and saving throws. And you get resistance to all damage. And basically the downside to this is you split damage between yourself and the character that cast it. So even though you have... 50% basically less damage taken from everything. The other person takes the other half. That's fine though, because it's actually easier to heal two characters uh, a smaller amount than one. So I personally like you using this. It is not required, but you definitely can. I also like to cast haste on Asterion at the beginning of important combats. I get from an item, but you can also have another character cast it. So you get the extra attacks and uh, get the AC, etc. Alright, quick edit from the future. Originally, I was going to initiate the Steel Watcher right off the bat, but I had a weird thing because of my relationship with them uh, that I had to attack multiple times before they would get angry, which killed a bunch of their health. So, in order to make this a little bit more fair, I had one of my other uh, characters initiate from up top, and I got everybody angry. Uh, so, here we go. Uh, unfortunately, that means I am unbuffed here, so I'm going to have to waste some of my time buffing myself with haste we should be okay though go ahead and uh, try and flurry blow topple her she had attacked me so I actually had a reaction to attack her for the first attack so that kind of help out helped out there and we're going to initiate here we, we want the steel watcher involved in the combat it's really not much of a challenge at all if he's not involved so we're gonna you can't topple him I don't even know if you can stagger him but we're gonna go up and try and do that Okay, nice little hit. And then again, uh, we're gonna go and use Wholeness of Body. Not super efficient to do it now, but we do get that extra bonus attack for the next three rounds. So while well, we didn't need the health or the extra key, we only had to use two. This is still decent. So we'll go ahead and Flurry of Blow staggers. There we go. I think one of them missed, unfortunately, but even with that miss. Uh, we did almost uh, almost 100 damage or 90 damage. We have definitely done well over 100 if the other one had hit. Kind of unfortunate that uh, we had 10% chance of missing and we missed on one of them. Now I do want to point out, I want to end turn. Uh, the AI can be a little slow sometimes, so I may edit some of that out if it's not, uh, if it's not important here. So there we saw a nice little reaction attack. Nice and dodgy there. Alright, we're back. Now we should have all our attacks, I believe. I think we still have haste. Do we have? Yeah, we still have haste. All right, so top all blows. Let's give it a shot on this guy. Oh, he did critical miss. That was unfortunate. Does happen. This guy went down. He's got only eight health left, which is real nice. There you go. Let's go ahead and uh, just use a normal attack on him. Normal attack on him. Did we really just miss? I think we missed on a down opponent. Uh, gotta love RNG, but then he died. Oh no, it was just a delay. Just kidding. The uh, game was overwhelmed with uh, the vampire awesomeness. And so what's kind of interesting here, we uh, we don't even have the plus one buff to hit from the vampire bites, etc. Which is always kind of fascinating. So do note, if you had bitten somebody uh, during combat as an action, you'd have plus one to hit, plus save. So uh, it can be even more potent than this. Let's go ahead again, see if we can stagger. There we go. Man, I got a second critical miss. That's very unlikely, unfortunate. But they do happen. Oh, and he's about to blow up. So at this point, again, we don't even have to finish him off. We can run off. Uh, and again, perfect example to show the mobility. Even after killing these two, finishing him off, we can still run over here and try and get this attack off ton of mobility boom and coup de grade him so there we go and let's go ahead uh, I'll we will uh, go out with a blast quite literally 
Boom shakalaka. All right, next we're gonna go ahead and take a look at what Asterion is like buffed. I did want to actually uh, begin by talk about Ilted Powers. They are optional, not re required at all, but I did want to point out that I did pick two of them for him. So against right here are the two ones I chose. Not required at all, but since it is what I chose in my character, I want to include it in the build. So favorable beginning, so the first attack roll or ability check you make against any target you gain a bonus equal to your proficiency bonus. And I also really like Luck of the Far Realms. When you make a successful attack roll against the foe, you can change that hit into a critical hit. Do note, I believe you can only use this like once per short rest or long rest. Doesn't really clarify it here, but it's not every single time you hit, you can't. That would be way overpowered. So uh, yeah, there's a limitation on that. Now, again, kind of, I won't call it fully buffed because you could do other buffs from other classes, but what I consistently do have on him is warding bond as mentioned it gives you a plus one bonus to armor class saving throw and resistance to all damage and it basically takes the other half that you don't take and goes to the character that you that cast that on uh, cast that on you it is an evocation spell i do want to point that out uh even though or abjuration spell sorry about that uh it's a level two spell called the warding bond and what's nice about it, it doesn't require concentration and it lasts until you long rest basically or disable it and i have my paladin cast it on all right the other buff that i like to have on him is haste so i do want to keep that show that and as part of the stat sheet so you have an idea on that there we go so stat wise right now he's got 25 ac uh, and normally he'll have 26 AC if you do your, uh, I don't know why it's showing 25. In, in combat, I believe he was running around with 26. I don't know if there's a bug or not. And you'll notice you have resistance to everything in this case. Um, there is a bug that it doesn't show all the damage modifiers on the multi-attacks. But as you can see here, the way I have it, his base unarmed attack is 1d6 plus 9 plus 1d10 necrotic plus 1d4 plus 4 radiant plus 1d4 force damage and so that's uh, part of that is the manifested cessation of souls that does uh, 5 to 8 damage here you're going to want to change this depending on what you're fighting the radiant damage is pretty commonly good but if something has resistance to that you can use psychic damage or necrotic damage so again that's part of the monk build we'll discuss that in a second so that's what the stats like look like now I wanted to discuss the equipment. So because uh, this character does a lot of my checks or most of my checks, I'd still wear the warped headband of intellect. I have a base eight intelligence on my build. So this ups it to 17 and allows for me to get better rolls on my intelligence checks. It helps again because I don't like swapping characters. Cloak of a protection is real nice for armor class and saving throw. Do you know what I believe there is a ring you can get in Act 1 that I didn't that does the same thing. I'm not sure if it stacks. If it stacks, uh, then please let me know in the comments if anybody's tested it out. I have not, and that would be a great alternate ring because my rings are not min-maxed. Uh, love this armor, the Vest of the Soul reju uh, Rejuvenation. Uh, you can purchase that here in Act 3. Again, don't want to spoil uh, the details story-wise where you go for it, but you can Google it if you'd like to. Big thing here is it is very monkey. You get plus two armor class, defiler's rejuvenation. The whenever they wear, when you say uh, succeed on a saving throw, which you're going to do a lot against the spell, you regain some hit points. But the other main thing that I really like about it is the greater Kushigo counter. The wearer can use a reaction to make an unarmed strike against any attacker that misses and again that's super potent because don't forget our melee uh, attacks are going to be 17 to 37 damage base right there for the gloves you can use any gloves that add resistance i just happen to have gauntlets of the tyrant again no spoilers on that it is story related potentially uh just the main thing for this for us one to force damage uh, and it increases your spellcasting DC uh, save. 
save DC, but again, not so important. You can basically take any gloves that are going to add one to four uh, damage, and there's a ton of them like this. The boots are huge. Boots of uninhibited Kushigo. Uh, the experience and deadly. The wearer deals additional damage equal to the wisdom modifier with unarmed strikes. And again, for us, that's a plus four bonus, which is really, really big. So um, I don't know if it accurately shows it here. Uh, I believe it is, yeah, it is actually the plus nine. So that's gonna be the plus five from the decks and plus four from that, that's really big. Uh, neck piece, I just use one that has Misty Steps. There's a million different ones that you can use. I just use this for extra mobility. My rings aren't great that I have, but they're fine. So get some combat regeneration per turn. I also find that this is buggy too. I don't know if this always works, but I threw it on there. And then I have the Ring of Twilight. So you gain a plus one bonus to armor class when obscured. So if you have basically some shadows in the area, this will bump up again. And that will make my AC 26 quite often. And then the bow is huge if you're not going to be using the warding trick. I keep it because it's got haste on it. This is the Dark Fire short bow. Amazing short bow. Mainly because he grants you resistance to fire damage, resistance to cold damage, and you can cast haste once per long rest as well. So that's the main reason for it. Not required for the build, but definitely helps a lot. And obviously nothing in the mail enhance. So that is all the equipment. All right, guys, I wanted to show you on this dummy uh, the number of attacks here that you can gain on this and just so much easier to show in this controlled environment. So the main things that are applying to me here are going to be the haste spell that's going to help us. And also I did cast wholeness of body, which gives you the extra bonus. And this is how at level 12 everything calculates. So I went into turn based mode. I'm ending a turn and we're going to kind of take a look here. So we're going to start with Flurry of Blows. So this is going to be attack number one and two. We'll do it again. Attack number three and four. Again. Five and six. And then here we go. Seven. Eight. Nine and 10 so there you go 10 attacks now remember you can you will only get the 10 attacks during that three turn period when you have wholeness of body then that drops off the remainder of the time uh you should have basically eight as long as you maintain your haste but all right now let's go ahead and talk about leveling up uh, astarian so at level one, what I actually start them as is a rogue. Remember, I want to be highly functional. And the main reason is this allows me to make him really efficient in a lot of different checks. Acrobatics I have, sleight of hand is probably the most useful thing I do with him. And I make sure I have one of the expertise points in that. Stealth is useful, although not necessarily necessary. I would say I don't use stealth that often, so I could see you for example, putting it into insight, that could be very effective as well earlier in the game. But if you want to be more natural and be a little bit more stinky as you level up, then feel free to keep it in stealth. Perception is huge. Again, expertise in perception. My whole goal of this character, on top of being a killing machine, is being able to find any traps and then disable the traps and then open any chests. I also put one in persuasion. I don't have a good charisma, obviously, but having this level up a little bit, it's going to give us enough of a bonus as you level up that especially with guidance from a cleric and then various ways of get it, getting advantage, you'll be able to pass pretty much any checks without really needing to save scum all that much if you do not want to. So that's how I have these set up for level one. Stat wise, we're dumping strength to eight. Dexterity, we're bumping up to 17, constitution at 15, dumping intelligence to eight, but again, as you saw with the gear, the helmet's gonna bump this to 17 so we can make intelligent based skill checks effectively. Wisdom 16, very important, not only for AC, but later on for bonuses to damage, and charisma again, dumped to eight. So that's your level one Asterion as a level one rogue. 
All right, at level two, we're gonna go straight to Monk and we're gonna be staying here for a while because we wanna get most of your combat benefits on this. Now, if you're just beginning, I could see the benefit of going about three levels into the Rogue and then swapping over, that's up to you. But I went straight over to Monk and started doing uh, the Monk combat. You're gonna get your Fleur of Blows, which is huge, your key power, Unarmed defense, which is going to give you uh, defense bonuses based off your wisdom when you uh, have no armor on. Martial arts dexterous attack. Martial arts death strikes. And martial arts bonus unarmed strikes. Okay. So at, at level 3, you're going to get second monk level. You're going to get additional key strike. Unarmed movement. This extra 3 meters of movement is going to really help you. Get from enemy to enemy as you become a murder hobo. Uh, patient defense. Uh, step of the wind dash. And step of the wind disengage. I rarely use these, if any, at all. I guess if you're getting attacked a lot, you could get patient defense on it. But I normally use most of my key points for the multi-attacks. At level 4, we're going to get level 3 a monk. This is a huge. We definitely want to get way of the open hand. Getting Flurry of Blows topple is huge. I use this for most of my multi-attacks to knock enemies prone. But you can also stagger or you can push if you want to push somebody off a cliff as part of an attack. So very, very useful. All right, at level 5, 4th level of Rogue, you're going to get your feet. You're going to get ability improvements. Want to get that dexterity to 18. More damage, more to hit, and more AC. And then we're going to get Constitution to 16. Uh, we definitely want to get a nice hit pull, a health pull as we level up. And this seven easy, even number is really, really nice and helpful. So we're bumping that up. Next, at level 6, we're going to get 5th level of Monk. An extra key point. Extra attack, which is great. You do get Stunning Strike Melee and Stunning Strike an Arm, but I rarely use this. I normally use the topples personally. But um, again, that's up to you. The problem with the Stunning Strikes melees is you got to pass a constitution save. A lot of enemies have pretty good constitution saves. So this is, again, I never used it, but it adds to your repertoire. If you want to give it a try, see how your mileage uh, goes, but your mileage may vary. And then at level 7, we get level 6 Monk. This is a big deal here. So we are going to get an extra key point. You're going to move now an extra 4.5 meters bonus instead of 3 while not wearing armor or shield. Key Empowered Strikes is huge. This is one of the reasons I only put one level in Rogue. Because now your unarmed attacks kind of is magical for the purpose of overcoming enemies' resistance and immunity to non-magical damage. If you wait too long to get this, all of a sudden you're going to find that a bunch of your attacks are going to be very ineffective against enemies. So again, Key Empowered Strikes, getting this as early as possible is huge. Also, you're going to get your two other huge elements for this build. You're going to get Manifestation of Body, Mind, and Soul. They're toggleable. And this is going to do extra psychic, necrotic, or radiant damage to your unarmed attacks. And then Wholeness of Body is amazing. Not only does it heal you, but you regain half your key points and get Wholeness of Body for three turns. This is so ridiculously good. So not only do you get one key point extra recovered per turn, but you get an extra bonus action. So you can basically use your Flurry of Blows three times in a round, which is six attacks just of that. Plus, once you if you have haste, you can actually get up to four normal attacks, which totals ten attacks as we saw with the training dummy. So that is just absolutely bonkers. Again, lasts for three rounds. All right, at level eight, we're actually gonna go over to Rogue, and we're gonna get Cunning Action Hide, Dash, and Disengage. So you can now do these actions as a bonus action instead of main action. Situationally, when you're moving around and positioning, this can be useful, even though it's kind of odd because we our bonus actions with Flurry Blows are more valuable than our main actions. But this is a prerequisite to our level three is where we want to get to. Now level 3 of Rogue, level 9 total is a big deal because we get your subclass and we're going Thief. So even though you get second story work, you master out of falling and gain resistance to falling damage, we're here for fast hands. 
gains an additional bonus action and there are no restrictions on this so yes you can use fleer blows of this it is absolutely bonkers good so uh, again this is the main reason for going thief and level 10 will go ahead and finish up our rogue levels of a fourth level in rogue mainly so we can get an extra feat again i like going ability improvements let's start with dexterity max out our ac to hit and damage all across the board get that to 20 and then we're going to go back to monk at this point at level 11 we are going to get one key point evasion which is also very helpful basically when a spell or effect would deal half damage on a successful dexterity saving throw it deals no damage if you succeed and only half damage if you fail and because your deck saves are so high and you have proficiency in it this is very uh, very good and then stillness of mind huge for a high level play if you're charmed or frightened you automatically cast stillness of mind to remove the condition so again high level enemies try and do these things constantly so it can be very beneficial and it's a nice little bonus and then level 12 we're going to take an eighth level on monk main reason again we're going to get a key point but one last feat again the simplest thing is to go ability points and now bump your wisdom to 18 don't forget this will give you one extra ac and then based off the gear i mentioned equipment if you get those boots that increase your damage by your wisdom modifier that's an extra plus one to all your damaging strikes definitely adds up with 10 attacks in a round that's 10 damage minimum extra all right boys and there you have it everything you need to know to create your own vampire ascendant if you have any feedback on possible improvements let me know in the comments below hope you guys found this helpful uh, again if you did please drop a, a like comments are huge to help with the algorithm so feedback good or bad uh it all counts the same would love to hear from you guys i'll do my best to respond as best i can and come back to you for some other builds and uh, as always if you want to see more from this channel feel free to subscribe love the support as always i'll see you guys in the next video